The session is called Using Live Streaming to Tell Your Digital Stories. And uh, nonprofits often shy away from the live streaming spotlight. And the goal of the session is to help motivate organizations to use free and powerful tools to their advantage, minus the fear of going live. Join Samantha Barnard as she discusses the benefit of live streaming and shares the top tips she has learned from her five years of nonprofit live streaming experience. And with that, I would like to introduce our today's presenter. Samantha Bernard is the development lead for Fambano Technology Development Center, NPC. She's based in South Africa, and uh, Samantha develops capacity building systems, which allow nonprofits in Southern Africa the opportunity to adopt software and technology solutions to achieve global social impact. Samantha, the stage is yours. I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, to discuss this very important topic, particularly in the year 2021, as we lead into uh, giving Tuesday season and also 2022 and what might be on the other side of the new year that's fast approaching. My topic for today is using live streaming to tell your digital stories. As mentioned through the introduction, I have five years experience as a nonprofit live streamer. Uh, I am a nonprofit representative myself. Pombano Tech is a South African based nonprofit. And our goal is to serve our beneficiaries, which are people just like you, nonprofit organizations in Southern Africa. We have an area and scope of up to 10 countries on the continent. And every single day, I speak to nonprofit organizations about using technology for good and for social impact and how to use some of the tools from the sponsors that you've heard of today, as well as some other little unknown tools that you might not yet have heard about or even thought to use so that you can then tell your nonprofit story. My goal for today's session is to just plant a couple of seeds of thought with you, whether you are a live streaming pro or you are a beginner. I'm here to tell you that I too was in your position and am still in the position that you are in when it comes to live streaming, even though I've been doing it for five years and telling our nonprofit story uh, for that amount of time. To start off with, let's have a benefit slide because it's always good from an M&E point of view. It's always good as a motivational point of view if you are a fundraiser, if you are a volunteer, if you are a social worker. And you need to go back to the decision makers that be in your nonprofit organization to let them know that you've heard of this thing called live streaming or you've heard of these tools and you need to motivate not only the time that needs to go into creating your content or using the platforms, um, but also anything surrounding collaboration from your team, because that is a critical component to live streaming and to digital storytelling, which you'll pick up as a theme of this mini conference over the next couple of days. So for me, from my perspective, one of the first benefits in a real time point of view is that uh, live streaming is pandemic safe. That I mean is last year, we were all put into this really strange situation where face-to-face -face consultations or events or meetings stop suddenly. And the pandemic has taught us that even though we might do things in a certain way, we might need to relook and streamline and also have a backup plan and a strategy on how to communicate, not just with our donors or our board members, but our team members, our colleagues, and most importantly, our beneficiaries. So live streaming to me is pandemic safe. It doesn't matter if your beneficiary um, is under a lockdown from a country level and has to be based at home. If he or she has got access to the internet and can follow you on whichever platform you choose, you can live stream and you can reach them. Another added benefit is that there are tools that exist for all levels of your expertise. You don't need to be a video editing or copywriting pro to go live. You don't even need to be a board member or a director of your nonprofit in order to tell your story. In fact, what you will hopefully learn by the end of this presentation is that those in your organization that you would least expect to be on camera probably should be the ones that need to be on camera. Added to the benefit list is that it is a cost effective way to deliver your social impact, which as a nonprofit is the most important thing to me. Yes, I can use my live streaming to do my online fundraising, which is a component, 
but I wake up every single day to share my social impact with the communities that I serve. And live streaming is one of those tools that is incredibly cost effective to help you deliver that impact. And then lastly, it helps you increase your brand visibility. And this was quite interesting um, that I'd already put this on my slide and reading some of the comments early in some of the, the earlier sessions. Sometimes we as nonprofits look at the tool in front of us and we're so used to KPIs and deliverables and meeting fundraising targets and M&E and, 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 and that we often look at our marketing in the same light. And that's not the case often. You may need to put in some time to build your brand visibility to become viral, to become popular. Um, you heard in the previous session of TikTok, and thank you for that session. I learned a lot from that. But you, you would have heard if you'd attended that session that sometimes your content can go viral. And often the best marketers will sort of look at it and go, we don't quite know why it went viral. It just went viral. So live streaming offers you a consistent, cost-effective tool to increase that brand visibility. Gone are the days where you could use radio or TV um, in the traditional sense to get out that repetitive, constant messaging about your brand and increasing its visibility. That has now been replaced with something called live streaming. So what are some myths that I hear every single day when I speak to nonprofit organizations, not only when I am live streaming, but when we are training on digital transformation in Southern Africa? Well, the first big myth is that we have nothing to talk about, Sam. You tell us to live stream and we really want to do it. Again, I saw this in the previous session with TikTok. Well, I don't quite know what to say. What kind of ideas do you have? It's a myth. You as a nonprofit organization have the most powerful stories. You are more powerful than any marketing agency or PR agency out there. You have got people on your team that can tell stories in a real and authentic way about your community, how you serve your community and your stakeholders or your donors that are helping you achieve that social impact. All you need to do is just have a conversation, just like what we are right now, to tell your story. You don't need fancy editing. You don't need high, high, high end graphics. You don't even need a large team. And that leads on to my second myth, which is the professional level is required. You need to have a huge team with, with a lot of live streaming um, experience. They need to know exactly which button to push or Sam, I'm, I'm, I'm worried I'm gonna break the technology or what happens if I don't push the correct button, that's okay try again and when you try again and when you let your audience know what you are trying to achieve i promise you they will help you on that journey and they will love you even more online for being authentic with them another myth is that you need expensive equipment and that's just not the case right now i am streaming to you uh, from the desk that i sit at every day to do my work and my laptop is propped up on a couple of books my uh, tripod is over here there's the proof, but my laptop can't fit in the tripod. And so you don't need very, very expensive equipment in order to deliver your message through some of the live streaming tools. You can start with very basic, very entry level tools. You can then work your way up depending on what your goal is from live streaming and from advertising perspectives, but you don't have to have very expensive equipment to start. That large behind the scenes team is required. It's not. In our case, as a nonprofit, again, servicing 10 countries, um, in South Africa alone, we have a market share of nonprofit organizations amounting to over 200,000. That's a potential group of 200,000 clients that we could speak to at any given time. And our team just has three to four people on, depending on the session that we're hosting. Typically, it would be myself facing the camera working on the presentations, delivering the content, and one other person moderating the chat. For you and your nonprofit, you may feel like it's just you. Again, I saw another comment earlier on that you are the jack of all trades, you wear multiple hats, but maybe you have a volunteer in your network. Maybe you have a donor in your network that could volunteer somebody on their team to do your chat moderation and so on. There are many creative ways that you can save money and not have that large behind the scenes team that everybody thinks you must have. And then lastly, expensive software and tools are required. And that again is simply just not the case. Um, for those of you that might just wanna go live on Facebook, well, 
All you need is your phone that you already have, and you need a Facebook app. That's it. You don't need anything else other than to go live on that platform. So what are some truths? I too, like you, am scared every single time I go live. And that is the truth. And that's why it's number one on my truth slide. Because I feel it's important to tell everybody in our network that there is a real fear to going live. There is a real fear to going virtual. Some people even um, have fears of going into closed Zoom rooms together. Many, many people fear that they're going to break technology or they feel so overwhelmed by so many different technology inputs and software inputs that they rather just say, no, it's not for me. But I do enjoy watching other people go live. I do enjoy participating when somebody else is going live. But I'm here to tell you that I too am scared just like you. I too worry that viewers won't watch me. And the best way to overcome that is to consistently go live. Sometimes you need to train your algorithms, you need to train your audience that you're going to be going live and it's a regular, consistent technique of yours. Sometimes you need to take into account the time of day that you're going live. It might work for you, but does it work for your audience? Sometimes you need to also take care of the topic that you might have. Maybe the topic is really important to you and it makes sense to your beneficiaries, but your online audience that you're live streaming to in the hopes to gain new eyes and new visibility, they might not understand your language. For example, the word beneficiary. We as nonprofits understand that word, but do other people out there actually know what beneficiary means and would they be able to connect the dots so much that they would click on your session when they see that you go live? The best way to overcome that is to keep doing it and keep trying. I too started with an entry level smartphone. I did not have a microphone. I did not have a top of the range phone. I did not have a tripod. I didn't have any of that. I even had to use mobile data. I didn't even have a Wi Fi connection at that point. So if you are very, very much in the beginning stages. You have no equipment. You've got a laptop with an internet connection. You have some social media platforms or you have a smartphone. You too can start your live streaming journey and you can grow into whatever goal you are wanting to achieve through your live streaming. Despite what anybody says, I'm here to tell you after five years that the videos that work the best are the raw impromptu streams and they will surprise you on how they go viral Maybe not in the sense of people sharing them, but how your audience would react and ask you questions. Sometimes we will put a lot of thought and a lot of planning into our live streaming and we will schedule them and people will register to attend or they will, you know, sort of follow and, and get notifications every time you go live. But the live streams that do the best for brand visibility, for authentication when it comes to who you are and having that human to human contact are those raw impromptu streams and think back to the TikTok session and if any of you are on Instagram and you're using reels do yourself a favor tomorrow just think about me saying this to you when you're scrolling through and have a look at the videos that don't have that massive production behind them it's literally somebody holding their phone close to them maybe sitting on their couch sitting in their bed reacting to stories from other people and those seem to be the piece of content that go live and the reason for that is that the people on the other side of the screen that are watching you identify with you when you look like them when you look like you're having a bad hair day or you look like you've just uh, sort of you need to stop and pause and drink your coffee because it's one of those mornings and you're busy telling that story the raw impromptu streams will surprise you and they can surprise you so please don't be fearful or think that you can only live stream if you have it fully produced and scripted. And then lastly, probably the most important truth for me as a marketer is that a live stream can repurpose, which is huge return on investment. So not only can you take your impromptu live stream and turn it into an Instagram story or a WhatsApp story, you could possibly put it into an email newsletter, you could download it upload it onto your YouTube channel and let it tick over onto your YouTube if you're part of the Google for Nonprofits program. There's so many ways that you can repurpose your live stream, which for board members, especially treasurers and finance people, there's that ding, there's return on investment when it comes to whomever it is on your team needs to invest the time 
to do the live streaming on behalf of your organization. So which tools are available? The, the blurb of this session said I was going to share free tools available to you, and many of you have got them on your phone right now. Facebook Live, Instagram Live, and WhatsApp, that's part of the Facebook ecosystem. And all of these allow you to go live at the click of a button, and it's free to use. Obviously, you need to have an internet connection, and you actually need to pay for the device that you'd be streaming from. But the actual software to use the streaming um, capability is free of charge for nonprofits to use. You also have YouTube, which not only from a live streaming perspective can you use to stream out, but I do encourage you to YouTube tutorials on how to live stream. In fact, any topic that's during this session for the rest of today or even tomorrow, all you need to do to learn more is just do a YouTube search and you will find amazing content out there which will teach you how to use the different platforms and different tips and techniques. That's how I taught myself all those five years ago. You heard in the previous session that another tool is TikTok, and I won't go too much into that because the previous session was overloaded with amazing uh, tips and resources. But again, very similar to the ecosystem of Facebook, you need an internet connection, you do need, you do need a device, but you don't get charged to start a stream on TikTok. We then have more what I like to call professional streams, and I put them in inverted commas because you can use your Zoom package or your Microsoft Team package to set up a live stream and stream it out to multiple places. If you are wanting to stream to many, many different places, including Twitter, LinkedIn, particularly if you're wanting to create a YouTube live stream where you put it on an unrestricted link, that means that the general public cannot see your stream, only small areas. So think of maybe silent auctions, annual general meetings, if that's what your nonprofit has, board meetings, maybe if you've got board members all over the globe, maybe you want to use a third party um, tool like StreamYard or Restream. The add-ons to those, however, is that as a nonprofit, you can ask them for a discount and you can then have some of the pro functionalities available to you. Things like being able to put on the bottom of your screen, your name, a link, whatever the case. But if you do want to just opt in for the free option, obviously it is available with limitations. So just make sure that you do price comparison with regards to what is free, what is pro, and what is available as a nonprofit discount. Now, which software and tools can you use not only before live streaming, maybe during live streaming or afterwards? Well, headline sponsor, I have to put them first and that's Adobe. There are a lot of products in the Adobe suite that you can use. Remember I said earlier on that your live stream could be repurposed and you could turn it into other types of videos. Well, the Adobe Suite have got uh, packages for you to use, whether it comes to video um, editing, maybe you need to do photo editing to add some screenshots in during your session after you've downloaded it. Whatever you need to do, you could look at the Adobe Suite uh, for that. Asana, I love. Because I have been live streaming for such a long time and I do put some planning into some of my types of live streaming, I use my Asana board not only as my planning board, but as my ME board. Often I would have to go back to my board members and let them know what my return on investment has been. A comment I saw earlier on in another session was, but tell me the impact. You know, what is the impact that you're getting from these platforms? Well, the only way to know your impact is to measure it. And I use Asana for that. I create a live streaming board with a topic and I'll pop in all my notes be it just before the event, just after the event, set myself reminders, and I will use that to track what my M&E and what my stats are directly from my software or whichever tools I'm using, and then pull a report um, through the reporting function of Asana once a month to be able to present to either a potential donor, a stakeholder, or a board member. Microsoft OneDrive, I'm sure you all know about the incredible um, storage that Microsoft offers nonprofits, and I use this for my backups. So don't download your videos, your live streaming videos onto your, your hard drives or your devices. Use your cloud software for that. Not only can you then have it sit there, and if you don't want to repurpose it just yet, or maybe um, you want to get a, a volunteer to help you edit it using Adobe, you do want to save that somewhere, and the ideal place is to save it in your one terabyte of storage on OneDrive. And then lastly, I use Google Calendar. 
not only to remind myself that I need to live stream today, but also so that I can track what sort of topics have I been live streaming about? Am I becoming too repetitive or maybe some of my topic delivery? But at the same time, I then take whatever it is that I'm going to live stream when I do script it. I open up Google Docs. I use the typing, the audio typing function, and I then have a blog. I just practice doing the live stream uh, topic or, or presenting in this case with my Google Docs open. It captures all my audio as it hears me talking. And there I have a blog post for my website or I have a transcript. We'll talk about accessibility a little bit later on or I have something to add into my newsletter. So I've kind of done a whole bunch of things from one idea for a live stream. So tips before you start. I like to ask myself the following questions and you can add on to this. You can take away from this. It is completely up to your brand, uh, your message, your authentic voice, your confidence levels and your live stream journey. But these work best for me. Even to this day, I still ask myself these questions before. And that is, how long should I wait for people to start watching me before I start talking? And there's some conflicting views on this. Sometimes my audience members wants me to start at nine o'clock promptly if I've said we're starting at nine o'clock promptly because to them, they've got other meetings, they've cleared their schedule, particularly for this, they don't really want to wait five minutes for us to let other people join in. And I agree with them. But sometimes, in some of the cases, particularly in some of our countries where, for example, there are internet shutdowns, we know maybe that there are audience members that might struggle to connect purely just because of their digital literacy levels then I do allow for that small window of maybe two to three minutes just to get everybody to stream in and then start presenting and then start the session. I always ask myself, Sam, is my camera facing the correct way? I want you to see me. I don't want you to see my cupboards on the other side of the screen. It is definitely something uh, that uh, you need to check before you go live. Can my audience hear me? Yes, I know it is a little bit frustrating when you as a viewer, you hear the presenter say, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? But that really is critical for us to know whether or not you can hear us or you can see us. Because sometimes depending on the software or depending on the device, you might not actually be able to see yourself on the screen. You might be looking at something else. So I also always ask myself, can my audience hear me? And how can I creatively make sure that they nudge me if they can't? Who will monitor the chat? This is planned beforehand. And it's always important that whoever is monitoring your chat, if you are going to expect to have a robust chat, that those people are prepped on your topic. Another helpful um, tip with this is that our team, and I hope Di and Arnold are on the call. If you are, say hi in the chat box. But these are you know, my, my two colleagues that help where we share links with each other before the events. And so they'll know if I say certain things in a certain way, during my presentations or during my topics, they will then pop the link into the chat to have immediate access for those that are watching because that sometimes is quite helpful. On the other side of that, we have also found that it can be distracting. If you post too many links during a live stream and people click on it, they will obviously then go somewhere else. They might not necessarily be paying 100% attention to you. So you've just got to sort of figure that out with your audience and it's always helpful to, to mention that in your housekeeping slide right in the beginning. And then lastly, and I wish I could show you, <laughs> turn my camera around, but I have got sticky notes all over my one panel here on my desk, which says, Sam, push the record button. Because many a time I have thought I've gone live and I haven't. And I've been talking to myself. Many a time using uh, Zoom and Teams, I thought that I am live streaming to Facebook and I'm not. Many a time I thought that I've pressed record and I haven't and I couldn't repurpose it. So make sure you've got a note somewhere <laughs> or make a joke like I just have to say, please let me know. Am I recording? If not, tell me in the chat and, and prompt me to, to press record. During the event and probably the most critical for all of you that are fearful um, of live streaming. And I do hope that after this, you know, we can all walk, walk a journey together because there is a lot of fear that goes into what about during the live stream event? Everybody experiences it and only with practice and consistency will you start sort of understanding your audience and, and understanding the nuances of the 
the same old people that join you or the same old people that comment and the new people and you get so excited where you see new fresh faces joining you and people sharing your live stream but during um, your live stream it's very important to know that it's okay to pause i'm sure you can all tell that i talk with my hands i'm sorry if it's distracting I do sometimes talk very quickly and even I need to remind myself, Sam, just take a step back and pause. That awkward silence is okay. Often people think it's just their internet connection and it's not on your side. So if you do need to take a bit of a step back and just breathe, that's okay to do it as well. Also, it shows everybody that you're a real person, that you are human just like them and they will appreciate your authenticity with them. Allow audience members time to use the chat. So if you do ask a prompting question or a leading question, often what happens is you'll ask a question. You'll say, hey, can everybody let me know in the chat right now, which tools do you use for live streaming? And then you'll look at the chat and nobody is, is messaging. And in those like first maybe four or five seconds, you're like, oh, my goodness, nobody wants to talk to me. But in that precise moment, you haven't taken a step back and said, it kind of takes a little bit of time to type out and some people might proofread and spell check and then publish their comments into the comments box. So it's okay. Allow your audience members to use the time. It's okay to use it as a pause and it's okay if there's silence during your live stream. And please only use the link below if you actually have a link to place below. And often what you can do with a live stream is if there's nobody um, posting that link for you, or if you are not posting that link in your chat box, say to everybody, I'm happy to post a link regarding whatever it is that I'm talking about. I will edit the description on this live video as soon as I've ended it. Come and check back in 10 minutes and the link will be there readily available for you. The reason why this is so important is because many of us think that when we live stream, and we have 500 people watch us in that moment. The minute that we click end, that's where the, the, the video dies in a way. And that's not the case. I have people contacting me that are watching my live streams from four years ago. And they still comment on them because we leave everything up and open for everybody to see. So it's important that if you are saying in a live stream from four years ago, I'll post the link down below for you to read more about my bio that you actually do do that because you never know who in the future might be watching a recorded version of your live stream on their social media platform. After, very important, I asked myself, Sam, <laughs> have I switched my phone off at least three times just to be safe? And that's because I promise you, I understand. If I'm live streaming from my phone and I click end, I will restart it a couple of times, switch my Wi-Fi off, switch it back on. If I'm doing it from my computer, I will just shut everything down, switch it back on again, because I want to make sure that I'm not streaming. Because yes, live streaming is cost effective. And yes, it is very, very easy to use. But there are some cases where people have actually been on a live stream and they didn't know that they were. It does come down to user error. But for me, I just personally switch my phone off three times. And that's part of my checklist immediately after the event. Immediately afterwards, as I said, with my Google Docs, I will go back if I have scripted anything. So if I've made notes for myself, and particularly if I'm presenting on behalf of a donor, or if it is a training session um, with beneficiaries that is very specific, uh, you know, I need to really have all um, of my documentation uh, in line. I then immediately, while it's fresh in my mind with people that have been asking questions, I open up that sheet and I complete the blog. You'll be amazed at how many questions come up in a live stream comment section that you can turn into blog posts or new programs. I've, I, we personally have created new programs purely from comments during live streams. Is it saved on my cloud storage? So after I've clicked end live stream and I've recorded it, have I selected the option to record to my computer? Is it going to my cloud? If it is going to my computer, how long more or less will it take depending on my Wi-Fi connection to download? If it's on a Facebook or an Instagram or anything like that, predominantly it would be downloaded onto my phone. So have I actually synced it through to my OneDrive and been able to put it into a correct folder so that I know where to find it? Because often when you download your video, it doesn't always get saved in the file name that you would expect it to be saved. 
most importantly for me from an M&E point of view, because I am the development lead, so a lot of my work uh, revolves talking to donors about our impact and asking them to fund us. Uh, so have I updated my Asana board with my M&E? And that's another amazing place that you can put comments or, or frequently asked questions in, in the comment section. You can sort of put that reminder for yourself in Asana to say, Sam, in three weeks time, you need to reinvestigate this because 100 people asked, what is Facebook? Maybe I should reach out to Facebook. Please Asana, send me a reminder that on this date, I should reach out to Facebook and ask them to help with more training in the area. Just using an example. Is my thank you social media post ready? After a live stream, depending on the topic, I do like to send out some resources. You'll see later on um, in a couple of slides the reasons why I do that. Um, but have I created a thank you social media post that is ready? Uh, some of you I see in the chat are using tools like Buffer. I also use Buffer. And so what I'll do is I'll make sure that my uh, calendar is open. I've scheduled the thank you post on all our different platforms and put a link in to watch the replay. Because again, you might have your live stream scheduled to go out at eight o'clock in the morning, but most of your nonprofit audience that you're trying to target is only available at 6 p.m. in the evening, but you might not be available then. Your thank you social media post for watching can entice more audiences if you post it at a time that they are online. And lastly, have I uploaded it onto YouTube or is my process in place to do that? When am I gonna upload it? Do I need to edit it? Who needs to edit it? Maybe I need to add something else in. And most importantly, am I gonna make it public? Am I gonna make it restricted? Am I gonna unlist it? What am I gonna do with my YouTube? Because that uh, does take a little bit more time when it comes to repurposing content, but it is so, so worth it with regards to your ongoing views and social impact. So a quick checklist for everybody. If you have no tripod, it's no problem. You should have books around you. You might have reams of paper. Well, we in South Africa, we buy paper for our printers in, in like big packs called reams. Uh, and I have often stacked mine. In fact, if, if all of you are on Twitter, what I'll do just after this is I'll share a photo that I took a selfie of myself where I've stacked my computer on multiple reams and multiple books um, to show you that that is actually what you can use. If you've got poor lighting, that's okay. Do you have a window close by? Um, and if you are close by to the window, can you close it? Uh, you might not want to hear the neighbor's dog barking if you are working remotely, or maybe you actually need to include that because you are a nonprofit that works with animals and you want those sounds to come in during your live streams to give that, that personal um, connection. Can you use this live stream as evergreen content? So is it a topic that you can turn into a post that you can use over and over and over Good ideas of this is if you are doing a online fundraising gala, let's say maybe you're going to have a, a silent auction as one of your uh, main areas of, of funding during your gala, maybe just beforehand, you might want to do a quick live stream about your team that behind the scenes will be facilitating the silent auction. And what you can do with that is obviously spotlight your team members, let everybody get to know who's going to be assisting them. Put a face behind the email or the name, and you can use that live stream to not only share information about your nonprofit and reach new audiences, but also market out your, upraise, your, your upcoming fundraising event. Then lastly, internet connection. What is my backup plan? So for many of you that are in United States, I, I imagine you would have really good internet connections and you wouldn't have to worry about things like internet shutdowns, uh, which many of us in Africa do need to worry about. Many of us in Africa, we have to worry about our electricity being shut off by the government, sometimes for up to 12 hours. One of our countries actually has just had that where they've been off for up to 12 hours. And so what is our backup plan? If this is a part of your strategy and you are heavily reliant on things like the internet um, and electricity, for example, what is your backup plan on how to communicate with your audience members that maybe you're moving it, or possibly could you turn this from a live streaming into a pre-recorded video to still maybe capture on the time and day that you would have had the session if you're out in your community, maybe you then just take a pre-recorded video and somehow incorporate it back into your strategy and then tell your story at a later stage during a live streaming session about how your nonprofit navigated the internet shutdown and 
electricity load shedding in one day, and this is what you did. Add it to that checklist. Have I scripted the session? So again, this is not for those raw, impromptu, my hair is a mess, I'm not wearing any makeup, or you know, really polished live streams that you might want to do. This is for those very polished live streams. Um, this is for when you need to have a script, when you need to have a very direct service offering and you need to tell people something very specifically. And for most of us as nonprofits, we are funded to do just that through our programs. I'm sure there are many donors that are wanting you to communicate certain things or are helping you to communicate certain things. And so you need to have that session scripted so that you are well prepared in advance. Are you encouraging viewers to stay to the end? So remember that I said um, a couple slides back that I do like to share resources after the session. And that is one of my creative ways to ensure that people stay right to the very end. Especially this year, in the year 2021, especially with remote and, and hybrid working. And let's all face it, everybody, we, we've been living through a pandemic. Especially for nonprofits where our workload went from this to this. We need to make sure that people don't get irritated. They don't feel impatient. We need to make sure that we, we sort of cover that and we are preempting that because that's kind of what our audiences are like. Uh, many people want to get to the point immediately and then move on. Not many people want to just take the time and, and listen and use their patience to take in what you're saying. And so creative ways to get them to stay to the end of the session is to say things like, Five minutes before I end, I'm going to be sharing a free resource with you. Do stay on. And after the fact, I will then email the link to those of you that RSVP'd via our email or whatever the case. Added to that checklist is, is your live stream inclusive of all languages and accessibility areas? I um, mean, this is something in the nonprofit landscape that particularly comes up over and over and over. If you are suspecting that your audience has multiple languages, what are you doing to talk to them in those different languages? Added to that, remember I gave the example of the word beneficiary. If you are wanting to target an audience that doesn't use our nonprofit language, which we all love, what are we doing to, to use different words? And, and how are we all understanding what we want to say and to who we want to say it? And then, of course, accessibility. There are third-party apps. There are add-ons. There are multiple ways that you can make your content more inclusive from an accessibility point of view? And have you gone through that checklist? Have you thought about it? Um, and have you investigated which software and tools are available? And then lastly, for those of you that are in countries that do have things like the Donate Now function. So for example, those that are in the US, you have got the Donate Now portfolio from the Facebook ecosystem, whereas we in Africa, we don't yet have that. So sometimes on different platforms, you might have functionality, you might not. It's always advisable to know that beforehand and to investigate beforehand what functionality is there and how can I use it um, to its maximum. Having said that, the best way for you to know that is to just go live and to just play with the software as you're talking to your audience members. Some of the most impactful live streaming sessions that I've had has been when I've been testing software. And the reason why is because it's so impromptu it is so just sort of the notification pops up on uh, my audience's um, uh, news feed. It says, you know, Sam is live and I see people join. I'm like, hey, Arnold. Hey, Di. You know what? I've got nothing much to say today. I'm just testing out some software. Let me know what you think. By the way, how are you? And a conversation starts in a very impromptu, informal, authentic way. And that's where the most magic happens uh, during live streaming often from an impromptu point of view. And so with that, with 15 minutes to spare for Q&A, I thank you for joining. Please know that as a nonprofit, speaking to another nonprofit, you have an amazing story to share with the world, not just with your community, but with the world. And live streaming is there to help you. You can start your live streaming journey, or for those of you that are pros, you can further advance it, further amplify it, test out new platforms with just one story. That's all that you need. And I promise you that our virtual community, so all of us from behind the scenes that are here today, and your virtual community wants to hear what you have to say. Those raw, impromptu 
videos where you are talking to people about your story, much like I have I've told you a little bit of my story and a little bit of how I do use the different tools and you can resonate with that. And hopefully I've been able to plant some seeds of thought with all of you. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Amazing, Samantha. This was a great session. I really loved all the tips that you gave. And uh, we're seeing lots of emoji love and lots of love in the chat. And I, I think if I had to pick uh, my favorite tip that you mentioned it was to take take a brief dur take a breath during the live stream and just take a pause. I think we we t we tend to forget that, and I think that was. We do have lots of uh, Q and A's, so lots of questions in the Q and A section. So I'm gonna head over there. The one that got the most upload is uh, let's see, I can do that. From uh, Sammy, do you have any insights to best amount to the best amount of time to live stream? Too short? Is it not worth too long? Uh, do people lose interest and wander off? Do you have any insights on that? Sure. So, uh, Sammy, thank you for your question. And it depends on your topic. So, if if you're in a high level sort of discussion, let's say you're working on gender based violence policy creation, white paper creation. The group that's joining, you know, those long sessions shouldn't shouldn't lose interest and wander off if that is sort of the community that you're trying to build. If it's a if it's an impromptu video that I find works for our audience is three to five minutes. Anything over that, if it's very impromptu, if I just sort of pop up on your news feed and I'm just there to chat with you and share some updates, if I go over that five minute mark, then definitely we do see people and uh, lose lose interest. Great. Thank you. All right, the next question we have is actually uh, came up two times. Uh, can I show this? From Julie, what is the best practice for time of day to live stream? What is it at the beginning, at the end? What is the best time? Sure. So thanks, Julie, for that question. And again, it comes down to your audience. Uh, so if I am wanting to, let's say, live stream on LinkedIn, which for those of you that haven't done that, I'm going to sort of divert off the topic here quickly. You do need to put an application through to live stream, to, um, live stream through to LinkedIn, depending on which country you're based in. But there is an option available for you to live stream on LinkedIn, which is incredibly powerful. If you are wanting to reach donors, for example, or a more professional market, if that is the tool that you're using, well, then you need to apply a little bit of common sense in the in in the sense of people that might find me and that are more professional. What time of the day might they be in meetings? Do I really want to live stream to them when they're on their lunch time? Maybe I want to get them first, first thing in the morning. And it's very similar to your social media practices when it comes to your posting times. If you are wanting to use Instagram or TikTok and you're wanting to reach a more youthful market, I'm not too sure which generation name we're on at the moment. But if you are wanting to reach a more youthful market uh, that might be in class and they, they, you know, university classes, let's say two o'clock in the afternoon, well, from three o'clock to five o'clock, they might not have anything else to do other than to watch TikTok videos. So that might be when you need to get on there. So it's it's all dependent on which platform you use and which uh, topic you have and audience you have. For us, what we found with our clientele that are working full day jobs, uh, we often uh, can reach them nine o'clock in the morning. We also find that for our email newsletters as well is a good time, nine to 10, and then uh, we're done. Great, thank you. All right, the so next question is from Gina, and she asked, how do you handle negative comments during the live transmission? That is such a good question. And again, you know, it does it, it does factor into the type of nonprofit that you have. I'm sure we can all imagine, you know, some nonprofits that are working in some programmatic areas that are going to get those troublesome trolls especially with some of the topics that they're talking about. And, you know, the best thing to do there is to have a group of moderators. And honestly, my approach is if you're going to troll on our content, we block you. Um, it doesn't matter if, if it could be a potential customer or a potential beneficiary. At the end of the day, that one person that is being very negative, that might not understand exactly what's going on, or is just trolling, because for some reason people like to do that these days, we, we disassociate from that and it's a block and it's a remove. What I would suggest doing um, is if it is somebody that is asking you tough questions, 
um, and critical questions to answer them openly. Often we find that, you know, if somebody's leaving a bad review, not just during a live uh, transmission, but if they're, you know, leaving reviews on your social media, the same theory applies during a live stream, where if you do handle that criticism openly and you answer it, it does add to uh, you being more authentic to other people watching. Great advice. I really like that. All right. Let's see. This one is from James. Have you ever done any post live stream research among viewers or constituent engagement, contact info capture, et cetera, for future contact? Absolutely. Uh, James, thank you for your question. We have, I'll be honest with you, on the Facebook ecosystem, there is something called the lead generation, uh, let's say, campaign that you can run where you can link it to your live streaming. For us in our particular region, uh, content wasn't that great in the sense that we would get a lot of leads, but they weren't leads that we could convert quite easily. Whereas if we've done it on LinkedIn, it's a much different market there that we can actually capture that, that information. If I'm doing a raw impromptu stream, and I do see Jim Connor has posted in the chat as well about that three to five minutes. So, so Jim, if I'm doing a three to five minutes um, stream, which is impromptu, it's just a, hey, how's everybody doing? This is what's new in our world. What's new in yours? I keep to that time frame. But if I'm doing an impromptu uh, live stream, then I don't do any contact info capturing or, or anything like that. When I do the scripted, the more scripted ones, what I'm finding particularly this year, and because I think so many people have got Zoom fatigue, so to say, so many people are really tired of sitting in webinars, even though they really want to, I do find a way to be creative because sometimes it's good to not record the session and share it out with people afterwards because you want them to be engaged with you. And so you want to then be able to have their um, information captured so that you can contact them in the future. Again, if you are authentic at all times during your live streaming and during your content delivery, people will gladly give you their information and want you to contact them. It's often those that are not that authentic that people feel, uh -uh, you're spamming me. I don't really want you to uh, contact me. And then just to end off, um, to answer that post live stream, there are a couple of third party apps that you can use to do uh, polls after the fact. I have not had a lot of luck with them. I have found during live stream research in uh, poll format or Q&A format or, or even breakout rooms, um, if we're looking at Zoom per se as a webinar, that is way more powerful um, than post live stream research. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. We have a question of, from Janet. What suggest suggestions do you have for the first two to three minutes while you wait for everyone to sign on before you get into priority messages? Cool. Thanks, Janet, for that. And I have seen so many creative ways to do this. Uh, my favorite, because I, uh, I am a gardener, I do love my garden, is I have seen people take their desk plants, put some notes on them, you know, put it in front of the camera for the first two minutes. It says, hey, we're just waiting for everybody to join. I've seen people, you know, have music playing in the background for maybe their phone and maybe they do a little bit of a dance or they sing to it. People, what we do is we have a slide up on the screen that says, you know, welcome. We'll be starting in exactly four minutes. Please mute. Please switch off your camera. Please note that we're recording. We sort of do all the housekeeping in that slide that everybody reads. And the CTA, the call to action that we put on for those first two to three minutes is please introduce yourself in the chat box and let us know where you're from. Um, so you can choose to do it with your camera on, with your camera off. Uh, there are many, many creative ways that uh, if you're on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook and you're scrolling and you're actually watching other people go live, you'll pick up many creative ways that you can use it. And add it to that, for those of you uh, that are representing the libraries, I have so many amazing ideas of what you could do in a library with books, especially those you know two to three minutes. So please reach out to us on Twitter using um, the event hashtag, and I'll share that after the session. Thank you so much, Samantha. I really like the plant idea. That's that's great. <laughs> All right. So looking at the time, I think we have maybe time for one more question. This one is from Jacob, and he asks, do you have any thoughts or past practices to get other staff members to use live video for success stories? My coworkers are not enthusiastic about live video. Absolutely, Jacob, and you are not alone. Uh, there are so many people, well, not people, there are so many nonprofits out there that are experiencing the same problem. 
honestly, if there are staff members that are just not wanting to go live, we still have to respect that. At the end of the day, it is their face. It is, you know, their personal information being out there. Um, but there is a way that you can be creative on not um, having them on the video, but at least getting information from them that you can then turn into a series. Even if it's just you telling your story or, or their story through your lens and, and a creative way to do that. If it is a policy that needs to be implemented, if you've got a board that decides that live streaming is the way that you're going to go and everybody will be on camera, well, then that comes down to, you know, board level and policy management, and it can be very difficult. But ultimately, if there is a co-worker that is just not confident at all, doesn't want to be online, you shouldn't be putting them on there. And the best thing to do is to go to that person and say, what do you suggest we do to tell what you are seeing out in the field? Or what do you most want people to hear about the work that you're doing and how can we creatively collaborate on creating that content? And then in terms of best practices, you know, to get other staff members to use your live video for success stories is just to start. If you are sitting with your team and you let them know that you too might be fearful or you too are also navigating this and how can you together as a team create the solution and you slowly work at it, often you will find that those staff members, they will see you as, as an equal, as a live streamer. And they'll see that you're there to hold their hand and to talk them through it. And they will be more trusting to the process. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. I think uh, looking at the time, I think we have to get closer to the, closing the session. But thank you again for all the great tips that you shared. Thank you, everyone, for attending the session. It was great. The Q&A section was, is still filled with questions. So really, really uh, useful tips and content that you shared, Samantha. Thank you.